Good afternoon and welcome to our Cato webinar, Licensing Restrictions and the CPA Shortage. I'm Mark Joffe, a Cato Institute Policy Analyst, and today I'm joined by Sharon Lazar, Director of the School of Accountancy at the Daniels College of Business, University of Denver, Brian Meehan, Associate Professor of Economics, Berry College and Research Affiliate with the Knee Regulatory Research Center at West Virginia University, and Boz Bostrom, Chair-Elect for just two more days when he assumes the role of the Chair of the Minnesota Society of CPAs. And Boz is also a Professor of Accounting and Finance at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. After the four of us speak, we'll take your questions, which you can submit from our event page from Facebook, from YouTube, or from X using the hashtag Cato Events. And please visit our event page for additional resources pertaining to this discussion. So now we'll start with Sharon, who will give us some background on the CPA shortage and what is causing it. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm, I'm setting the stage. And one question always comes up is, what is a CPA? And those of you who wanted to find someone to help you with your tax return this past season may have uh, um, wanted to find a CPA. It's been kind of the gold standard of a signal of high quality in our profession. But the reason we have a CPA certification is because of the capital markets. Back when railroads were trying to raise money to uh, lay lines in the late 1800s, people needed to rely on good financial statements. And it was the accountant certifying those statements that gave rise to this role of a certified public accountant. The, uh, so if we, ha if we have some slides, I think. Uh, we can go ahead and go to that first slide. Next slide, here we go. Okay, the history of the CPA. So only a CPA can attest to the fairness of financial statements. A CPA is not needed for anything else, it, but you do need the CPA to attest to the fairness of financial statements. And the history of the profession goes back more than 100 years. It predates our income tax law. And it started in New York where the capital markets were really starting. And in 1882, the New York Institute of Accounts required members to pass a test. And so I guess you would say that was the first CPA exam. But in, uh, also in 1892, there was a competing organization formed, the American Association of Public Accounts, and they called for a college of accounts requiring their candidates to complete a thousand hours of training. And so that's, that's a, the predate of our current experience requirement. And they also called for restricting the practice of accounting to those who passed an exam and had five years of experience. So these two competing organizations went back and forth. Uh, the New York Institute of Accounts did not call for a restriction of practice, but called for those that were holding themselves out uh, as CPAs to pass an exam. The two joined forces and lobbied for legislation that created the first law establishing the CPA designation in New York with an exam re required. And in the 1899, the College of Commerce, Accounts and Finance was formed at NYU to educate these future CPAs. Other states quickly followed the New York example, but they all had their own take on what kind of education or experience would be required. So next slide, please. So the CPA, as I said, it, it, its role is to certify financial statements so that we know where to make investments. And I would say it's because of the CPA that we have a prosperous society. You don't want to invest in money losing operations. You don't want to throw money away. So how do you make those good investment decisions? 
the CPA acts as the policeman or the referee, the referee of the capital markets. And so as the profession developed, uh, there was uh, created a federation of state societies of public accounts, and they created a model CPA law. And as I said, the states started adopting their own laws. But from the very beginning, the education and experience required of CPAs has been a controversy. The very first article in Journal of Accountancy in 1905 was titled Education and Training of a CPA. Eventually, the American Institute of Accounts was formed and created a CPA exam in 1917. So again, predating our tax law, which came in at about the same time. And the American Society of CPAs was a rival group that was formed. And again, those two groups eventually merged and created a uniform CPA exam in 1952 and then changed their name to the American Institute of CPAs in 1956. Next slide, please. So moving along, in the 1950s, there was a big focus on education that's germane to this discussion uh, because of the last bullet point on this slide, and I'll come back to the others. And that is in the Carnegie and Ford foundations both became involved with what a proper education should be. And they both came down on the side of a four-year baccalaureate degree that was steeped in liberal arts education. And out of that, uh, the accounting then study or the accounting major, and I rounded these numbers, so it adds to more than 100%, but it was roughly half liberal arts, 30% business courses, and 25% accounting courses. So in the United States, the education of accountants was in the university system. And you know, there are speculations that that was to legitimize our education or perhaps to shift the burden from the profession to the university system for educating accountants. But in either case, it lies in the university system to educate those accountants. In other countries, the UK as an example, they use more of an apprentice model where the profession educates their future professionals. So in the UK, the professional body regulates who can practice in accounting, and they take on the burden of educating them in what would be called a structured learning program, where they learn some material, they take exam, they learn in some more material uh, as they are on the job and then take another exam. And they progress through, I believe it's 14 levels of exams. It'd be interesting to look at these two models a little bit more closely because I think you might find that uh, those that go through the UK model have lower starting salaries than those who go through the US uh, uh, model uh, by a pretty substantial amount. And so that, that's something to also keep in mind. The Perry Commission uh, was also folk, uh, formed in the 1950s and it was a you know nationwide commission looking at the education of CPAs and came down on the side of more than a bachelor's degree would be required. But that wasn't the first time more than a bachelor's degree being required was proposed. It was actually proposed in 1932, so almost 100 years ago. But at that time, the time of the Perry Commission in the mid 50s, only three states even required a bachelor's degrees for CPAs, and that those were New York, New Jersey, and Florida. Next slide, next slide, please. So there are were numerous and still are numerous studies and commissions uh, about the CPA profession, the education and the experience requirements. And so I'm skipping over many of them. There, there are enough to fill a book. But following one of them, the Horizons Report, 1967, the AICPA adopted a policy stating that at least five years of college study would be needed to learn the common body of knowledge expected for CPAs. 
And NASBA, the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy, adopted that same policy in 1976. In the 1970s, it's the first time we also had government looking at what accountants were doing. Senator Metcalf formed a commission that looked at the profession and started calling for government regulation of accounting policies. And that led to the AICPA and the profession becoming more active in promulgating their policies and um, uh, initiated really a, a very a thorough look at how accounting was done. In 1978, the AICPA explicitly called for a graduate degree for entering the profession. In that statement, they reinforced in 1988 or restated in 1988, but yet for reasons uh, that have been described as, you know, being able to move forward in that direction, uh, the AICPA Council resolution in 1987 called for new members after the year 2000 to have 150 credit hours of education without a graduate degree. So that call for a graduate degree was dropped. Next slide, please. So with the focus on credit hours, you know, we, we've kind of lost this idea that the graduate education was the way to go. But in addition to dropping the call for graduate education, there was also a, a dropping of specific education requirements. And so instead of specific course recommendations, it, the recommendation became kind of more broad, you know, uh, to have you know, again, liberal arts grounding, no more than 35 to 50 hours of business education and 25 to 40 hours of accounting education. This, you know, can be contrasted with some other uh, professions. Some other professions are much more prescriptive in what they require from an education standpoint. So, for example, the a professional engineer needs to have a four-year engineering degree from an ABET accredited school plus four years of education. I have a colleague in a, the, uh, the psychology department who told me that they are required actually to follow specific syllabi in their course requirements for their licensing boards. So it, it is a, a different model or there are many different models of tying education to the profession available to follow. Some states were very prescriptive in setting the 150 hour requirement. Florida, for example, who was the first state to put in the 150 hour requirement, they passed the law in 1979 to be effective in 1983. They were very specific. You had to have six credit hours of business law. You had to have an auditing class, a tax class, a managerial cost accounting class. It was very, very prescriptive as to what was in uh, those hours. When I first moved to Florida in 1992, my memory is they required 36 credit hours in accounting, and they were very specific as to what those hours were. Florida noticed an increase in the CPA exam pass rate after putting in the 150 hour requirement. But again, they were very prescriptive as to what the students needed to learn. Uh, but almost right away, uh, people were starting to question the 150 hour requirement. In 1999, Albert and Sack published a paper that questioned the 150 hour requirement. And they were the authors of a 2000 study titled Charting the Course Through a Perilous Future. In 1979, uh, the, a member, uh, a trustee of the Financial Accounting Foundation, Frank Minter, questioned the 150 hour requirement. And so then we go into macro trends. So what's happening out there? Well, we've had a decline in the number of CPA candidates following the implementation of the 150 hour rule. There were 
anecdotal stories. There were stories that were state specific, but um, Brian will be talking about studies that have looked at that very rigorously. Some states have changed their licensing rule to 150 hours, but not necessarily the rule to sit for the exam. And so students were able to sit for the exam before being licensed qualified. And by 2008, 19 states allowed candidates to sit for the exam at 120 hours. And that number has only grown. And so again, we can look very rigorously at the effect of being able to sit for the exam earlier versus later. Also over the decades, alternative certifications proliferated. By 2010, there were 35. And some of those were very, very specific, like you could become a, a certified bank auditor. Uh, but you know, again, the only thing that you need the CPA for is to provide assurance over financial statements. Uh, there are conflicting, uh, you know, it, it, there's conflicting evidence about the, the effect of automation. Automation generally is a tool that allows accountants to be more productive and earn more money. But on the other hand, investments in software by companies has been found to be associated with lower wage growth by accountants. And then another trend to keep in mind is remember the Carnegie Foundation, the Ford Foundation really advocated for that four year degree but there has been a growing interest and growing push for three-year baccalaureate degrees. BYU-Idaho has had their three-year degree approved by their accrediting agency, and Indiana just passed legislation. Uh, I, I don't know if it's, if it's been signed by the governor yet, but it's very new, uh, requiring all their state universities to have a three-year degree very soon, within the next couple of years. And so that's something, if we move to a three-year baccalaureate degree, a 150 credit hour requirement becomes even more onerous than it is today. So let's go to the next slide. And we can't ignore the salary trends. In uh, 2008, uh, a 2008 paper uh, quoted, is. Um, a, another study where a, a, the authors had noted that a master's of accountancy graduate with a big four firm in New York City earned approximately 69% of the starting salary of an investment banker and 60% of the starting salary of an, an associate at a law firm. And that was in 1985. By 2007, those numbers were 35% and 45%. So real wage differential increasing. So that was a 10 year period of time or more, um, more than more about more than 10 year period of time. The next 10 years, uh, we have another look at by Friedman Sutherland and Vetter in a 2004 paper, noting that in the decade 2009 to 2019, wages for accounting majors went from being about $5,000 below a finance major to $17,000 below. Well, since then, some salaries have increased, uh, but those trends definitely cannot be ignored. Go to the next slide, please. So what's, happen what's happening on the demographic side? Well, on the demographic side, the number of college age students nationwide is declining. So just demographically, looking at the census data, we know we have fewer students coming to college. In 1990, 22% of undergraduate business school graduates were accounting majors and 10% were finance majors. And by 2021, those numbers had flipped to now only 14% graduating with an accounting major and 16% graduating with a finance major. Making the demographic trends even worse are FAFSA, well, we can tell by FAFSA filing rates. FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid is, a, is filled out by every high school student wanting to go to college uh, to secure a financial aid package. 
And the FAFSA filing rates were typically around 54% post, pre-pandemic. Uh, post-pandemic, we had a dip. They were starting to tick back up. But this year, we had a complete fiasco with a FAFSA application. And last week, Inside Higher Ed reported that completion rates are down 27% from last year. There's a, a very broad survey that is conducted for entering university students every year by the Department of Education. And the number of or percentage of students entering college that are questioning whether it's worth it keeps increasing. It's 30 percent. Uh, students looking at where they're influenced, they're influenced by a class they took. 80% of the students will note that. And we've had fewer offerings of accounting in high schools. And we've had more offerings of financial literacy where financial literacy courses look at Department of Labor numbers and share with students how to look at starting salary information in the different occupations. And that's not a good look for accounting. They're also influenced by their mentors and their family members. And I think I've gone over my time, except that, you know, we're, as we talk, there are some pipeline solutions being, being mentioned these days that I'm sure we'll have more opportunity to talk about. But the first four of those are really just a reduction or a, re a relaxation of the 150 hour rule, uh, watering down those extra 30 hours even more than they are today. And so I question whether are those really solutions. Um, thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Sharon. Now we'll turn it over to Brian, who will do uh, a little bit of an academic literature review for us on CPA supply issues. All right. I'm going to do a little screen share here. Uh, that look good. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm Brian Meehan. I'm an um, associate professor of economics at Barry College, which is in Georgia. I'm also an affiliate with the Knee Regulatory Research Center, which is at WVU uh, in Morgantown. Uh, if you're interested at all in occupational licensing issues more broadly than just the CPA debate, uh, the Knee Regulatory Research Center is, is a great place to go. They've got all sorts of, of uh, policy briefs on occupational licensing across the US. Um, they do a great job synthesizing the research and if you wanted to dig into the data, they also have the best data for looking at occupational licensing rules across the U.S. So just a little uh, shout out to them. So what I'm going to be doing, I'm just going to do a brief uh, overview of the research uh, regarding the 150 hour rule um, for CPA ac accountants. Um, this is uh, Sharon has already done an excellent job discussing the history behind education requirements for CPAs uh, and um, and how those have evolved over time. And so uh, I'm going to touch on the effects. Uh, typically, when we think about occupational licensing, there are in two ways that this can kind of go. Proponents of, of stricter occupational licensing um, like to promote the idea that occupational licensing improves the quality uh, of the service being provided. So it provides a baseline um, for the, the quality that you're going to get for a, for auditing, for a CPA, for example, um, or for, you know, whatever other licensed profession you have, some sort of baseline knowledge, some baseline expectation. Um, on the other side, there's people who talk about how licensing restrictions uh, can act as a barrier to entry to people trying to get into an industry, right? So, so when you erect a barrier to entry, you reduce supply and then prices go up. And um, in this case, um, you're protecting your, your salaries, you're kind of protecting your turf. All right. So a lot of the research has been is looked at this uh, for occupational licensing uh, more broadly. And I'm going to focus on the stuff that looks at the implementation of the 150 hour rule uh, and how that impacted both gauges of quality of uh, CPA services and entry into the profession. <clears throat> All right, so the first, 
paper that I'm gonna that I'm gonna touch on is from 2006, which is from uh, Carpenter and Stevenson. Um, he's a, Stevenson is a colleague of mine here at Barry College, uh, and they looked at the early adopters of this 150 hour rule. So you have so many states moved, as Sharon touched uh, on a little bit. I think it's Florida was the first state to move to this uh, 150 hour setup from from a standard kind of bachelor's degree. Uh, situation in order to obtain and take the CPA exam to requiring 150 credit hours of education to take the CPA exam and obtain the occupational license. So this paper looked at that implementation and it looked at how it impacted candidates sitting for the exam for the first time uh, and then pass rates. Okay, so the idea here is Hey, if 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 this 30 additional hours of education uh, is providing a useful set of skills um, for for students to be more prepared to increase the quality of uh, of the CPA's work, then you should see that they're more prepared for the exam and pass rates should go up. And it turns out that um, that there was a large reduction in the number of first time candidates taking the exam. Moving to that 30 additional credit hours turned a lot of people off, but it didn't it, it didn't turn off only the unprepared accountants. <laughs> OK, it it uh, it reduced entry and it didn't have any impact on the passing rates for the uniform CPA exam in states that adopted the 150 hour rule. They remained the same. There was no difference um, in a more recent paper. Uh, John Berrios looks at the adoption of the 150 hour rule, finds a, a, a similar to the Carpenter and Stevenson paper, finds a large supply side reduction in the number of accounting candidates after the implementation of the 150 hour rule. Uh, and then Berrios tracks kind of career performance, um, looks at both the testing performance and then actually goes through LinkedIn profiles to see what happened for career outcomes of CPAs under the 150 hour rule relative to CPAs under just the bachelor's degree requirement. And he finds no difference in career advancement. Uh, per, people that are earning promotions, uh, looking at how long people work in public accounting, things like this. There is the move from 120 to 150 didn't have any impact on on any of those markers. He creates a giant database of of all these accountants and looks at these these career outcomes over time. And there's no difference. So it doesn't look like um, from both of these studies, it doesn't really look like this additional 30 hours of education is is really improving the uh, the quality margin. But it is having large impacts on the quantity margin. It is having large impacts on the supply side here. And these supply side impacts have as has been shown by this more recent paper by Sutherland and co-authors. The, these supply side impacts have had a disproportionately negative impact on minority CPA candidates trying to get into the profession. Their access to things like financial aid for for the uh, the additional 30 hours is a bit more curtailed than 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 non-minority groups. And so these groups fall out more. Uh, after the implementation of the 150 hour rule relative to uh, relative to majority candidates. Um, so this is it's, it's a it, it's a, a really large disproportionate impact. Uh, the entry decline is 13 percent more than non minority candidates that are dropping out here. Uh, and this paper also looks at the quality margin and they 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 can't find any differences in testing performance. Uh, they can't find any uh, differences in, in some of the career outcomes that they look at. So that uh, there, there's not a whole lot of uh, support for this additional 30 hours uh, increasing the quality of accounting of, of certified public accounting services. Um, but it, there is strong evidence that it's reduced supply. <clears throat> there's been some moves to liberalize the 150 hour rule a little bit recently. And this is the paper that I um, published in 2020 with with uh, Stevenson, uh, with Frank Stevenson, and uh, Sharon touched on this a little bit. But there's been some bifurcation of the of the CPA rule to sit for the exam. 
So instead of attaining your 150 hours, credit hours, essentially your, your master's degree, um, but it doesn't have to be master's in accounting, right? Um, and then sitting for the exam and obtaining licenses, students could go through their, their bachelor's degree education, obtain 120 hours of education, and then sit for the CPA exam at that point, see if they pass, <laughs> Uh, and then obtain the additional 30 hours to uh, get the license. So it created a bifurcation. You only have to have 120 hours to sit for the exam when this, when this rule is implemented. So we looked at this bifurcation as a liberalization of the, of the 150 hour rule in a number of states. Uh, and what we find is that with that move, it increased the supply of first time candidates. It's just, it's just the move, the opposite of the other moves, and it gives you exactly the expected result. It's a supply side increase, more entry into the profession. And again, it doesn't seem like there was any relationship to quality here because it didn't impact pass rates. There was no impact on pass rates by bifurcating this rule. Uh, and if the 30 hours make you more prepared to be a CPA, there should be some impact on that margin. And there's just, there's just all, all these papers cannot find it. All right, I'm going to quickly go over. Uh, so that's that's really the debate on 150 versus versus 120. Um, and uh, that's that's one degree of liberalization. Uh, if we if we want to go even further than that and think about licensing alternatives, I mean, it is the case that uh, that a lot of a, a lot of um, uh, professions that require very specific and specified uh, knowledge do not have occupational licenses. Um, so I've, I've got a few of these, uh, private certification. And, and it's just because a CPA is backed by the, uh, the, the license, right? So if you, if you get a CPA, you're, you are then eligible to, um, to, uh, do the auditing right for for public firms um you you can engage in, in in public accounting and if you don't have the cpa license you cannot so that's that's licensing certification is different it's not government backed it is a it is a it is an informational uh, it's a piece of information that the market can use um to judge the quality of the service being provided so auto mechanics have uh, competitive certification asc certification uh, has many different levels and it provides a signal of quality for auto mechanics you can think about all the people in computer programming jobs and coding jobs right now uh, and they have a, that that is a very specific set of of knowledge that you need there's lots of certification competitive certification um, that happens there to provide information, to provide some sort of baseline quality. And it's not licensed. Economists, <laughs> we give a lot of policy advice. Um, we're not licensed. Uh, and yet, uh, the Federal Reserve Board has tons of economists, and they hire them at different, different levels of education, um, and they're able to somewhat determine the qualifications of the economists without licensing. Uh, and uh, same thing with Amazon. Um, and uh, so I think there there are alternatives. Uh, it's kind of uh, you have to look at you have to you have to consider these alternatives um, in relation to the the uh, existing situation with licensing. Um, and uh, so this would be a much a larger liberalization of licensing, obviously. But uh, but yeah, that covers that covers all the research there. And I think uh, I'm out of time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I'm now going to cover uh, one aspect of this issue that I think receives a little less attention, which is uh, the effect on government accounting. So there are 90,000 state and local governments across the US, according to the Census Bureau. Over 30,000 of those have to produce an annual audit because they issue municipal debt securities, they spend more than the $750,000 threshold of federal funds that triggers a single audit or they're open to some or affected by some state reporting requirement. Now, governments use different financial reporting standards. The Governmental Accounting Standards Board just celebrated its 40th birthday this year. It was formed in 1984. And there are different things that you have to know to, to perform government accounting. Uh, those are covered in a summary way on one of the core CPA exams 
and then they're covered at greater depth in one of the um, uh, you know, extended CPA exams. Uh, there has been some noticing in the profession of the effects of this shortage. Uh, the AICPA had proposed to remove uh, all of the uh, government accounting questions from the core bar exam back in 2019, 2020. And that generated a lot of negative feedback from the profession. I, I wanted to just highlight uh, the red uh, text from the California Society of CPAs. It said, inadequately staffed government accounting departments and insufficiently qualified audit firms leads to delays in audits and reporting of required public information. The Illinois Auditor General added that audit quality at state and local governments continues to be problematic at both large and small firms with the profession responding to this problem by establishing the AICPA's uh, Governmental Audit Quality Center. So if we look at the two issues, uh, timing and quality, uh, we have some statistics to, uh, to review. This is a, a graphic that was produced by a financial data provider to the municipal bond market, Merit Research Services, working with the University of Illinois at Chicago's Government Finance Research Center. And they looked at uh, the lag between the fiscal year end date and when the government audit showed up. And we'll just focus on the darkest black uh, series here. So you can see that back in 2010, it was under 150 days. And you know, just to put this into some context, Usually 10 Qs and 10 Ks are expected 45 to 60 days from publicly listed companies. So, you know, if you're at 150 days, it's already a long time to wait for an audit by private standards. And you can see this is uh, episodically increased and now is well above 160 days. And this, this uh, survey is somewhat biased by the fact that they cut off before all the audits come in. And so if you look at you know, some more granular data. This is collected by uh, the Truth in Accounting organization that uh, does an annual report called Financial State of the States. So they cut off in September 19th of 2023 for fiscal years ended in 2022. And that's generally would be for government June 30th of the year. So this is the uh, lag time between the fiscal year end date and when the audit was filed, it was filed by September 19, 2023. And as you can see, three states didn't even make that cutoff and several others were well above 250 days. Those are in the, um, in the right column. Uh, there are super delayed uh, entities and I survey some of them here. Uh, Mount Vernon, New York, uh, which is not an insignificant uh, town. It's a suburb uh, north of the Bronx in uh, New York State has not uh, filed an audit for any year ending later than 1231, 2016. So there's something like, you know, seven years late with our audits right now. And this affects solvency. So Chester, Pennsylvania is a city in Pennsylvania that's in chapter nine bankruptcy. They have not filed since 1231, 2018. Um, Compton is a city that had uh, recurrent problems with our financial reporting. They skipped producing annual comprehensive financial reports for the years 2014 through 2017. And now their latest report is from 2020. I put this together last week. And uh, as I was doing this, I found that one of my uh, entries on here, Port the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, which was another case of municipal bankruptcy, uh, has started to catch up a little, but just a little. So uh, on April 10th, just last week, they filed their 2022 annual comprehensive financial report uh, 650 days after fiscal year end. So this affects uh, credit quality as uh, ratings and ultimately the cost of financing for municipal governments. As uh, Liz Farmer, a very well-known commentator in the municipal finance space said that a ratings withdrawal that could be caused by tardy audits can result in being charged a higher interest rate the next time an issuer borrowers borrows in the municipal bond market. With respect to quality, this is really, really hard to measure. Fortunately, the state of Florida is particularly thorough in terms of monitoring local government audit quality. Um, and they, they do an annual report. And I just want to focus here on the first line item. So of the statements that they looked at, 
13% of them contained mathematical errors not related to rounding. Now, this has not really gotten worse. It's gone up and down uh, since they have started doing this uh, many years ago. But you think with the improvement of technology that this is a problem that would actually go away, but perhaps because of the shortage of accountants, not enough checking is being done on these uh, financial statements. So with that, I'll turn to Baz, who will um, wind up with some more academic research and um, discuss what's going on in his state of Minnesota. Thanks a lot, Mark. Fun to listen to uh, the perspectives of the three of you as, as part of all of that. You know, I got into um, uh, um, I got into academia back in 2004, and it was right around the time that Minnesota was enacting this 150-hour requirement. Um, but I, I uh, kind of lived through um, lived through interesting times. I was with Arthur Anderson when they crashed. I didn't cause the crash. I never billed any hours to the Enron account. So, but I was with Anderson when they crashed. Went over to Deloitte, Minneapolis, and then realized that I wanted to do teaching and mentoring for a living. Uh, so that's when I then in 2004 went into academia. Um, 150 hour rule was just kind of coming new at that point in time. And instantly it was it was very interesting. Um, we were looking at how are we best going to prepare our students to meet this 150 hour requirement. And we're a uh, liberal arts college, we really don't have any master's programs outside of theology, at least that's where, where, where it was at the time. We, we still don't have any business related programs. So we explored ways to get them through and uh, our students through in four years as, as with the 150 hours as compared to having to do the 100 and, uh, excuse me, the fifth year to get to 150 hours. And um, over time, what, what started to happen is, you know, we, we would have students that would take online courses and very rigorous accounting and finance subjects, but we were also were not noticing just kind of an increase in quality in those students. If anything, um, you know, they, they were just trying to get through them very quickly. So over time, we had students that started, you know, asking, well, can I just take courses in anything? Could I take a personal finance course? And the answer is, yeah. Could I take, um, uh, you, know, you know, could I take a, a health-related course? The answer is, yeah. Medical terminology, the answer is, yeah. And then especially, so with that, some um, just kind of concern started to grow that we would have students that were spending extra time and extra money to get to these 150 hours without getting education that was positioning them for their success in the careers. And, and, and then we also noticed that the employers were as aggressive as ever recruiting our students and telling us that they were great students and, and uh, they were, wanted to hire basically as many as possible. So for me personally, it was just kind of a developing frustration with the 150 hour rule, which only got exacerbated under COVID because then students became more and more comfortable with online learning. Uh, so then that would mean that they got more uncomfortable going to community colleges, taking courses like online yoga, personal fitness, fitness walking, volleyball, canoeing, photography, things of that nature. Um, so just a lot of scratching my head trying to figure out the purpose you know, of the rule and what it was really accomplishing. Because again, our students were not then going into the, the, the workforce and suffering. In fact, our students once ranked third in the entire nation, including all schools on the CPA exam. So they were they were qualified and they were having success. Well, so it's always been a little frustration, but once all of a sudden we, we have started to notice and, and looking at the research regarding the shortage of CPAs, and we've already heard some about that. But in addition, the AICPA issued a trends report that said the number of CPAs has gone down by 34%. And that's why you're seeing these delayed audits. It's why if you ask someone over the last month to try to find a, uh, an accountant or CPA to do your tax return, you were going to find a, a, a very big struggle to identify that person. And if you could, they were going to be a lot pricier than they used to be. So we, we did not have enough CPAs to serve the public. So as a result of that, we, you know, have, a lot of questions have been asked over history about ma making alternative pathways to the 150 hour requirement. Nothing was happening. So in Minnesota, we, um, uh, the Society of CPAs introduced legislation. It's bipartisan legislation, which should tell you something there, support, uh, uh, you know, both uh, um, uh, from the Republicans and, and from the Democrats in the House and in the Senate. And we introduced that. 
and uh, it's, it's starting to proceed this spring. And in fact, the first committee in the Minnesota Senate heard that and passed it unanimously, and it has moved on to the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, so it is progressing in the legislation this spring. And, um, you know, a couple other just statistics, you know, regarding that, and, and, and Brian had, I think it was Brian who commented on this. I mean, this the Center for Audit Quality did research and found that 32% of business majors considered but did not pursue an accounting degree because of the 150 hour requirement. They said they cited it. I should I should phrase that properly as a major barrier with no other barrier being higher. There certainly are other barriers like salaries, like image, like work hours, as an example. But 46 percent of black and 49 percent of Hispanic students who considered accounting as a major set, um, cited the 150 hour requirement as a major barrier. So because of this, we have introduced that legislation and it is moving forward. 85% of our own members had requested a change as well. So we're just listening to our members, we're listening to the public and we're looking at that research. As it stands right now in the early days of doing this, we had debate, we had discussion regarding the merits of the 150 hour rule. The debate and the discussion that we're not seeing uh, any more on that is just uh, is regarding the merits of the rule. Uh, if you look at more recent opposition and and uh, and just kind of listen and read what they're saying, they cite mobility as as uh, uh, as the biggest concern that I'm, we're hearing these days, which is a very real issue currently. A CPA in one state can go practice in all 55 U.S. states and jurisdictions. Um, because there's uh, the, the rules are substantially equivalent in each of those uh, in each state. Because of that, the Minnesota legislation, as drafted, um, has a July 1st, 2026 effective date. So we have not yet had a hearing in the House, um, but uh, we, we th this could end up in an omnibus bill, which would happen uh, uh, next month uh, in, in May of 2024, if it is passed. There is uh, there's a two year period to work through issues related to mobility and uh, and continue to work through with the AICPA, uh, with NASBA on, on projects that they're currently working on to help fix this problem, fix the uh, uh, fix the problem of not enough CPAs, as well as address the, the issue of mobility as well. So something that I'm certainly passionate about because I want to do what's right. For the, I want to do what's right for the citizens. I want to do what's right for people who need help with taxes. I want to uh, do what's right for, for, for small businesses who need audits, government agencies who need audits, but then also do what is right for our students. We should not be making our students, especially students of color, spend additional time and additional money to not receive better results. All right. We, we heard some of the research that, that Brian cited, not only from his own research, but John Barrios's research. There's, they're investing this time and money. In some situations, that's a fifth year. They might be spending $30,000, giving up a year of work, an opportunity cost of $70,000. So it could be a $100,000 of cost to not advance in their careers, to not get that benefit out of that. So that's what's been um, going on, and that's and that's why we have uh, proposed the legislation. And I think with that, we got about ten minutes, Mark. So I'll just uh, I'll cut it off right here and uh, open it up, uh, throw it back to you, and we might have some questions. Yes, uh, thanks, Boz. And uh, since no good deed goes unpunished, uh, the first hardball is coming at you, uh, Ron. A recovering Big Eight CPA wants to know how about making the CPA profession lose its monopoly on audits open it to competition by, for example, having the stock market select and pay auditors for listed companies. So do you think the CPA profession should be a monopoly? I mean, a, a great question on that one. Um, so I still find a, and this goes back to what, what, what Sharon had talked about initially, I still find a lot of value in having CPAs be in, be in charge of those audits that have, that have passed this very significant hurdle in the in the CPA exam, um, I you know with, with, with something like that, I'm always happy to listen to any other perspectives and and look at research, uh, look at research on those issues. So me personally, right now, still sees a lot of value in <clears throat> audits that are led by CPA firms that way. Um, that's all I'll say on that one. Great, thanks. 
Uh, Sharon, I'll try this one on you. This came from uh, an anonymous uh, listener. Uh, what portion of CPA exam takers take Becker or another paid test prep resource before taking the exam? And do you have any comment on what this might say about the quality of the degree in education? <laughs> Well, like everything, there's varying quality across any spectrum. So there are very high quality educational programs. There are low quality educational programs. The percentage of candidates who take a review course, I could not tell you. I could tell you that many of the employers of the accounting graduates provide a CPA review course. Either they reimburse it after the student has paid for it, or they have arranged directly with the provider to provide it for their new hires. So I would say that those students who go into public accounting, particularly with a national firm, probably do take the CPA review course. Does that mean that they didn't learn the material? I'm not sure I would go that far. I think there's a lot of value to structuring your study time, to studying with others, to getting together with people that you are going through school with and studying on the weekends. And they use those review materials as a way of structuring that learning time together. So I, I think there's value in the structured learning of uh, the structured review, I should say, of what they've learned regardless of whether they learned it well or they didn't learn it well in the first time through. Thanks. Now, Brian, this question actually came in before the webinar started and it's, it's one I've heard before and I'm wondering if you could take the first whack at it and then maybe um, Boz and Sharon may have uh, views as well. To what extent do you feel the accounting shortage is caused not by the 150 hour rule but by relatively low starting wages compared to other fields like finance, law, engineering, and tech. So, I mean, <clears throat> the only thing we can do is really speak at the margin, right? So at the margin, the 150 hour rule reduces the number of people entering the profession, right? Uh, and, and so it's true that the, that the opportunity cost of those other careers is gonna be appealing uh, for a number of people who will take those paths, but the the hundred the the inaction of the 150 hour rule exacerbates that issue, right? So if salaries aren't keeping up in in public accounting for one reason or another, uh, the uh, the hundred the adoption of 150 hour is going to make that worse. And uh, and by liberalizing the 150 hour rule, you'll see more going to 120 you will see more entrance. Uh, so it will move at the margin, right? Um, Do you want me to jump in? Do you want it, Sharon? Yeah, go, ahead, go, ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead, yeah. boss. I mean, I, we're, I'm at a small liberal arts college and we, we are so close with our students. I met with a hundred students over the last month about that are considering careers in accounting, finance and business. Um, and our school's money almost never comes up. So whether or not they want to major in accounting is uh, is whether or not they want to invest the time to do that, whether they like it, whether they can get it, or whether they're just passionate about about something else. So we do hear we do hear a lot of chatter that if we paid people more, that um, when I say we, if, if if starting salaries were higher, as an example, that we could attract additional people into the profession. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's nothing stopping anyone from doing that right now. I mean, go ahead and do it. It'd be interesting to see. And first of all, salaries have come up. So if you ever see any statistics on salaries where someone is claiming that the median is 60 grand or something like that, I think that's outdated information. So our students who are going to work in the Minneapolis area are now making, um, uh, they've signed their contracts that are going to pay them in the low to mid 70s, including signing bonuses on top of that. So it's something that, yeah, if you pay more, it is going to make it more attractive. From a practical perspective, I, I don't see it. Um, it's, you know, we, we go back to that research of the Center of Audit Quality, and, and uh, there was no barrier that was considered higher than the 150-hour requirement. So is it going to help? Yeah, but uh, I think it's just one of, the, one of the things that could help as well. And I, would I, I can't control it. I can't, I can't tell Deloitte to to start their starting salaries higher before there's several hundred thousand people across the world as the number one professional services firm. I can work to help 
change legislation and also work with the AICP and NASBA to, to, to consider alternatives on a national level. I can, that's all I can control. Yeah, I, I think return on investment is something that um, students are aware of. And if the investment is an extra year of time, extra tuition dollars and foregone, foregone salary, and then the return on that investment is, you know, a starting salary that's no higher than you could have gotten with a different major in uh, with a four year degree, then they question that. Uh, and I, I would say that that's one reason I think graduate education will continue to exist. Good, high quality education does have a return on investment, uh, a hollow extra 30 hours. I think the research is pretty clear in showing that there doesn't seem to be the return on investment there. Thanks. Uh, I, I love this question from Peter. It's somewhat rhetorical, but Sharon, if you have any comments, uh, I'd welcome mm -hmm. them. Peter says, I'm a CPA that was subject to the 150 hour requirement and my credit hours included first aid and trap and seat shooting. If the requirement doesn't require additional accounting education and it isn't ineffective at raising standards, why has this rent seeking been able to hang on for at least 25 years? That's a very good question. That's my question too. And I think that, you know, in the beginning, um, you know, as I said, Florida, when it implemented its rule, it was the very first one. It was very prescriptive in what it required, not only from an accounting curriculum standpoint, but also from the business education hours. But mm -hmm. as uh, you know, other states adopted it and the rules were lighter, easier. I, I had a wonderful student in a graduate program when I taught at one of the Florida universities who had an undergraduate degree in a science field really, really smart candidate, but to get 39 hours of business on top of the 30 hours of accounting he was getting through our master's degree program and qualify in Florida, it was it would have been a lot more time for him. So I actually advised him to move to another state where they didn't have that rule. So I, I think that, you know, if again, if the tie between what the profession really needed and the educational requirements were strong, then the ed education might make sense, but that tie is not strong enough to make sense. Yeah, and if we had if we had more accountants than we had positions available, we might be considering, should we require a master's program, right? So, but we're nowhere near that right now. So we're the exact opposite way of that. So, um, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we have time for one more question. I'll direct it to you, uh, uh, Brian, given what you talked about in terms of uh, alternate certification uh, path. Uh, Vance asks, what is the perceived threat to health or safety of Americans whereby CPAs should be licensed? Why not allow increased competition and online reviews and word of mouth to push bad accountants out of the market, thereby improving things for consumers? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. It comes down to, I mean, this goes back to an old economics article um, by um, uh, George Akerlof about used car markets. And the idea is that there are so there's so much lack of information in these markets about the quality of the car or the service that you're going to get that you need something to give you some sort of minimum uh, bound that uh, you can count on uh, when you're getting the service. If that can be provided privately, like through, I mean, it certainly can. There's a, well, it, maybe for CPAs, it could be provided privately. And there's a number of competitive certifications that exist for lots of specialty uh, professions. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the, the justification for, for licensing is the quality and the information, the lack of information that consumers have about the product that they're getting, right? And so yeah. proponents will say that you need to have that minimum level of education to pro actually provide the service that you're advertising. So it's to avoid the snake oil salespeople, right? <laughs> um, and, right. Uh, and that's in, but the, but the thing is, like the snake oil salespeople don't make they don't make money very long <laughs> if you have a exactly. if you have a really competitive um, kind of market based certification or, um, or or reputation reputation mechanisms things like this uh, those those can those can serve those purpose to 
to to inform consumers uh, and producers and markets to to make them operate more efficiently. Whereas licensing is a, is a strict. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. That's a great great summary. Well, I wanted to thank you for everyone for joining us today, both the speakers and the panelists. We did have more questions, and unfortunately, we couldn't get to all of them in the hour that we had. The video recording of the event will be available on Cato's website, and I will work on getting the presentations up there as well. So uh, check back in a couple of days for that. And with that, I'll wish you a great afternoon. Thanks.